Thank you, John. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A couple little things before we begin. One is something I discussed a little earlier. We have a survey in your bulletin. Some questions that we'd like your answers to. Uh, we're facing an interesting time in the church, and it's going to require the help of and the God-given talents of each and every one of us to uh, get us through. And that's one thing that God wants us to do together as a community. So please answer these and get these back to us that we can look this over. This is kind of like uh, an extension of the hymn recommendations, which I find so incredibly useful. This will take us a little farther. And two, every now and then life gives you a moment of revelation. Now when I was a child, I was pretty hard on myself. And if things didn't go quite perfectly, I blamed myself for that. Now, I have taken up the, the hobby of model railroading in my uh, more recent years. It's something I tried back in the 70s, and I decided to try it again because it gives me peace. But N scale is teeny weeny, 10 feet equals 1 inch, to give you a sense of scale. And some models, back when I was a kid, if a model didn't go together right, it was my fault. I blamed myself. I just didn't get it right. If only I were a little better. Not so. I was working on a very simple model, I thought. I was kind of embarrassed with how simple it was. A little gas station, kind of see on the corner from the 60s, the 50s, right into the 30s. And it seemed, oh, this would be simple, this will be easy, until you get into it. And little tiny pieces, like the little gas pumps have been split in half. Now put those together. Don't let scene show. It's like, that was just a level of orneriness that didn't need to be there. And the ultimate was, when I started putting on, do you remember those decals that you had to put on with water? And how they didn't want to go quite where you wanted them to go? Well, I actually watched a video on how to do it right. Got that back down. But I was putting this little decal on the ice machine. It just said ice, right? Just one decal, right? That should be easy enough. Just need to get it straight. No, I started to get it off. Turns out those ordinary people had made those individual letters, those individual decals. So as long as you have to put them on, you had to line them all up. And that was just a level of orderliness that was not required, guys. That's where you make children feel like they're incompetent. It's nice to get older and realize, now, wait a minute. I hope you have some revelation during the week that reminds you that it's like, now, wait a minute. Maybe it wasn't me after all. So just, just a little side note there. Now let's get into the, the order of business. Let's talk about solitude. Sometimes those revelations come to you in a moment of solitude, as it did for me when I was working alone. See, I can't bring that back around to where we are. Now, on Tuesday morning, I was, came into the office, and I found Skip outside, and I found a worker across the street. All this equipment, what in the world are they up to? Well, there's a leaning power pole over there, seriously leaning, and they're, getting, they're replacing that. And so they put in a straight power pole. Somebody else will take away the leaning one, I guess, after they transfer the wires, but they had the power off in the building. And it was going to be off for about an hour or so, so Skip and I conducted what business we could there in the dark. And then I did what paperwork I could there in the dark, because of course this is a computer age, you're going to want to do a whole lot, you're going to need your computer. And then I had a little while of solitude, a little time when it's me and God, because none of my equipment is going to do what I want it to do. So it was a little bit of enforced solitude. It was dark, it was quiet, it was calming. A little unexpected time with God, and as God so often does, a little illustration for my sermon. God does that quite a bit. Solitude, when we can get it, is well worth savoring. It has a lot of other benefits, too, as we will discuss. Jesus, I picked this moment of solitude for Jesus because it's very familiar to all of us, and it's the moment of the worst crisis in his ministry. He has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane before he is being betrayed, as he's being betrayed, before he'll be arrested and crucified. He's had the Last Supper, and now he takes a few of his closest friends, 
And it's going to be a 15 minute walk in the dark to get from where they had their dinner on the second floor to the garden itself where Jesus will get some solitude and some time to pray. And Luke tells us that it was Jesus' custom to do this, to go away, to be quiet before major events in his life. In fact, at every pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry, he, he took some time to step away to speak with God. Friends that he brought with him this time were of no particular help to him because they were so deep in their own grief because he's told them what's going to happen in general terms and they finally come to believe that to a degree. And who wouldn't be in grief? And he asked God, if it's possible, remove this from me. And again, who wouldn't ask for such a thing to be removed? It's such an awful prospect what laid ahead of Jesus that he is sweating so profusely it looks like he's bleeding. So we have to ask ourselves, where does his strength come from to carry on under such dire circumstances? Today we face trouble, but not crucifixion. Glad to say. But unlike Jesus, it is not our custom to head off for solitude most of the time before momentous events or decisions in our life. It is challenging to find solitude because we are surrounded with all sorts of devices that are continuously trying to engage our senses. When was the last time you experienced solitude? When was the last time you had a moment of true silence? So quiet you could hear the air pressing against your eardrums. When was the last time that happened to you? What did it take to make it happen? Was it a power failure? Like on Tuesday? Was it something else? I think that we have adopted the broadcast media standards of what we should not have in our life. And for the broadcast networks, four seconds of silence is too much. In fact, it's so unwanted, they call it dead air. And I'm afraid we've gotten to the point where we're considering something beyond four seconds of silence, dead air. And we're missing out on a source of incredible power and support for our lives. But we're going to find out a little bit about what solitude provides. At every pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry, he went off to pray alone. Jesus didn't think this was a waste of his time. Jesus never considered this unimportant to, be, uh, to have a little downtime from his very important work. He never thought getting away from others was something he should deny himself. To be with God was central to him, because God was central to his life and to his purpose. And he met God in prayer and in meditation, in silence and in solitude, away from the crowds that grew so big early in his ministry, he could no longer go into towns, because they were waiting for him there. He had to conduct his ministry out in the countryside. And he used that time to recharge, to center himself, to calm down before dealing with the demands of his critical ministry again. We find Jesus walking the shore of the Sea of Galilee. We find him heading out in the pre-dawn glow to find a place to be alone to pray. We find Jesus withdrawing from the crowd to lonely places to pray. It's, we're told that he strolls through the grain fields. I don't recommend grain fields. Farmers get upset about that anymore. By the lakes, into the mountains, up on the high mountains. When John the Baptist was executed and the news came to Jesus, he took a boat by himself and he rode away off to some place where he could be alone. He spent time in private houses. He walked from one town to the next. You often hear about Jesus and his disciples going for a walk. Sometimes that was 90 miles. That might be four days 
when they had some time alone, some solitude. That's how important it was to Jesus. And of course, there's that faithful night in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Jesus made his most important decisions. This is where he dealt with his strongest emotions. This is where he met his ministry's demands and cared for his own soul. This is where Jesus would often teach his disciples. And this is where he prepared for important ministry events, including that crucifixion that was just around the corner in the verses we read today, and where he reconnected and strengthened his loving relationship with God. In silence and solitude, especially if it's shared with a few others, the thoughts and the feelings, and you know these thoughts and feelings that you shove to the back of your mind that you put away in a little box for later, and that if you don't get out at some point, they're going to burst out in some uncontrolled way. Well, that's the place where you can unpack those, bring them out, examine them, bring them to your attention, and deal with them when you've got that solitude, that silence. And on this particular night of Scripture, here, on that last night with his disciples before the crucifixion, it's around 10 or 11 at night, because people stayed up late on Passover night, speaking of how God had saved them all. And so as they left the second story room, as they headed out into the night, into the streets, toward the garden, they may have heard the murmuring of voices from the houses around them as people related what God had done. And then they head out and they arrive into the quiet. Maybe they heard the rustling of leaves by the wind. And Jesus asks his disciples to stand sentry duty for him while he heads off further into the garden so that he can be with God. Jesus took every chance that he could to spend time with God, perhaps to receive God's still small voice and the messages that would be drowned out by all the activity and the noise of daily life like the commotion that Jesus faced every time he entered a town. Or even when he taught around the lakesides, on the mountains. Jesus was able to be obedient to God at this critical time in his life because he had cultivated a lifelong love with God by being alone with God. A close relationship through solitude and silence. Jesus' loving relationship with God gave him the strength to do what must be done. And in that strength, Jesus found courage he could tap into all his life. To be like Jesus, we need to seek silence and solitude on a regular basis. We need to get past the idea that downtime is wasted time. We need to toss the idea aside that we constantly need to be doing something. That we, this feeling of being pressed upon for time is progress and forward motion. Being pressed for time makes it hard for us to function as human beings. We need to get energized. We need to be in touch with a loving God and the strength and the courage that can be found in that love, in cultivating that relationship. To get in touch with God's spirit or God's inner light, as the Quakers say. We need to stop being distracted and scattered people, pressed for time, running endlessly, always in touch with everybody but God. We need to stop draining that battery and never recharging it before we all topple over in absolute exhaustion. So go ahead and find some solitude. Be like Jesus. Go walk 
on the beach, go to the lake, go to the stream, go to the shore, go to the mountains, have your home, be quiet, turn off the stuff, and be still. Go to an empty church. It's plenty quiet in here during the week. Go off to the fields. And whether it's dawn or dusk, high noon or the dead of night, go. Go look at the stars. Go listen to the wind in the trees. Go watch the waves. Go look at the clouds. Go watch the light filter through the green leaves of the tree in the summer. Watch the ants. Kids have the right idea about that. Watch the flowers nodding in the breeze. Go out and shovel snow when you get it. But don't hurt yourself. <laughs> Go walk the trail. Sit by the creek. Write in a journal in a quiet room. Be with God, who's always seeking us out of love for us, who always wants to hear from us. Let God listen to us and let us listen to God in return. And we can learn to still the voices in our head that are not the still small voice that we're seeking. We can learn to control the cacophony that is our own thoughts, all the worries and the fears and the plans and the critiques, and to be still and know that God is God. Frederick Buckner wrote, what deadens us most to God's presence with us, I think, is that inner dialogue that we are constantly engaged in with ourselves, the endless change chatter of human thought. I suspect that there is nothing more crucial to true spiritual comfort than being able from time to time to stop that chatter, including the chatter of spoken prayer. Be still. And he says, only once or twice am I actually successful in doing that, and that is a grace from God. So be like Jesus. Make solitude and silence a regular part of life. There's still so much more that I could say about solitude and silence, ironically. <laughs> I could go on and on, but that would defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? So start with this instead. Find a favorite spot to sit and be still. Go to the garden alone or with a few friends. Sit with God in silence and let that silence still the contradictions and the failures we are holding against ourselves. Richard Rohr notes that God loves us silently because God has no case to make against us. The silent communion absorbs our self-hatred. So let solitude make us strong, make us courageous, make us more like Jesus. Now let's pause for a moment of silence. Amen. <laughs>